Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session. My name is Zuena Bacho, and I'll be the moderator. Now, for this session, this session will feature four video clips highlighting the state of mental health in Kilifi County and various forms of mental health interventions. Between the clips, our panelists will elaborate, will elaborate on the topic at hand. Now, allow me to introduce our panelists. Her name is Mary Buta. She is a trained nurse and a mental health researcher based at the Camry Welcome Trust Research Program. Her research involves developing and evaluating interventions to improve access to quality mental health care in rural areas of Kenya. Hello, hello, Mary. Hi, Zuena, hi. Hi, how are you? How is Nairobi treating you? I'm actually in Kilifi. Um, I'm good. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kilifi is, I mean, it's, it's treating me well. It's, re it's a really hot time of the year, but we are good. We are fine. Thank you. I can imagine. I hope you're ready for the panel because we are about to start with the first clip, which is actually we are going to watch the first clip, uh, which is an extra from the film displaying the tragedy of an anti-hero, Changawa Kahindi Kadoma, the man in chains, a man confined for years to a hut in a rural village of the Kenyan coast due to his mental problems. Um, if we can just start watching the first clip and then as we come back, we'll have a comment. To, uh, we have the panel, I mean, we'll have Mary coming back with some comments on the first clip. Ganga Kala zoya ni muganga bevria. Ala badaye. Kwa chakutu mwani utuwa kukala akingiranda zeni. Ni wakatu wakulala. Ya na chesa mato. Mchewe na shanga mtu yunu. Ariebe na chesa mato kukeresi. Na kalala. Mtu wari ya namna yana. Anaga eleza. Haya. Kwa chakutu mwani kuwa wana atu. Kaya sama tu ni mwakwe, taku mchimbire muche. Kwenda kwe baba, kala nihari ya kwenda sama bevi isho, kwa kala anona atu kaya sama tu ni mwakwe. Tamche wa kifunga mimba, taki shalangu anari ya nefadama, musichana. Tukara hata kwenda panda zulu, hali ya kukala. Hata ni mishikurani. Kwa shalangu anamungenga, mche kukari kwa kada zihala. Tafiwe. Haya. Wabizu mateso gari ya ubeni hero waga pataka pindi hangu ni mfulana. Kwa kushoma wa shoma kirikisa ni wago mambu kwa kuronga ronga kwa kamba ni uganga kwa zubira na kwa kushoma. That was the first clip uh, called The Men in Chains. Um, Mary, could you tell us more about the, the clip? Um, so, um, so perhaps I would just start by briefly putting one what um, Difusimo really is uh, before I should talk about the clip shortly. So this is, like you said, a mental health awareness, and it's a collaboration between a research institute, um, a documentary and filmmaking institution, um, a cultural association, and then the county government, who are like the you know 
by stakeholders in terms of policy and practice. And so um, we use different forms of art, music, um, dance, poetry to provoke dialogue about mental health and mental illnesses. And what we do is that we archive our stories and then we share these stories and these outputs in terms of in forms of short clips and uh, films and documentaries. Now, what you've just watched is um, a short clip of one of the most powerful stories yet that we've collected in the field. Um, it's the story of Changawa. Now, Changawa is a man in his mid fifties and uh, the documentary itself is called The Man in Chains and you can access the full documentary um, in our website, um, www.ppsimo.org. Now, it is the story of Changawa who has suffered from schizophrenia for the past 30 years of his life. Um, and what we have seen in the clip was just Changawa's brother um, trying to explain how the disease um, started or how Changawa's illness started. And according to um, the beliefs of the Mijikenda or according to the belief of Changawa's community, um, Changawa was actually a son of a very powerful witch catcher. His father was very popularly known to catch witches. And when Changawa was about 15 years or so, he started developing symptoms, which we believe were the early symptoms of schizophrenia, which is a very severe and a very disabling mental illness. So it includes things like hearing things that other people are not hearing, seeing things that other people are not seeing, we call them hallucinations. But according to the members of the community in which Changawa lives, which is the Giriyama community, they believed that Changawa was developing power similar to that of his father. And so um, when Changawa's situation deteriorated and became worse, um, they believed it was because Changawa was trying to outshine his father, or trying to be better than his father. Whereas what we believe was that uh, because the psychosis was not managed, it kept on deteriorating. Um, now, very sadly, um, Changawa went through a very complicated pathway of care from traditional health practitioners, faith healers, um, even biomedical practitioners eventually. But we say that the story that Changawa is an anti-hero because very sadly, um, this year in August, Changawa succumbed to his illness and um, may so rest in peace. That quite that's really interesting um, and a really interesting story. I can't wait to watch watch the full sh uh, film. Now we have actually the second clip that's going to be coming up. Uh, the second clip, the clip that we're about to show, is a video montage of images showing Difu Simo participants learning, filming, communication, and video editing skills.
Right, that was the second clip that we just watched. Mary, can you give us an overview of the clip and also discuss uh, Difu Simon's mission and approach? Sorry, we couldn't hear you because of the network. Can you kindly repeat that again? Yes, absolutely. Uh, more than three challenges. <laughs> um, technology. So, I mean, I, was just saying, um, I hope you can hear me well now. Yes, we can. Great. Um, so I was just talking about um, Difutimo's mission, which is actually just break free from, you know, the chains of stigma attached to mental illness. And we aim to do this by initiating dialogue about mental health and mental illness starting in Kilifi and hopefully, you know, the rest of the country and the region, etc. And I'm deliberately say I'm deliberately not saying raising awareness because the aim of the Husimo is not just to talk at people, but it is actually to encourage people to talk amongst themselves and also to allow us to learn from them, you know, in the process. And what we want as the Husimo is for people to open up about how they conceptualize mental health and mental illness in you know, their different cultural contexts and how these conceptualizations influence how people with mental illnesses are treated um, in the community. And this approach is what we call a participatory approach or as people like commonly referring to nothing about the people, you know, without the people. So the clip that we've just watched it just takes us through one of the methods that we use. We call it participatory videos, which is where people with mental illness themselves, these are people with lived experience, their caregivers, um, they, uh, they come forward and they share their stories through video. So what we do is just we train them on how to use the equipment, how to use a camera, the editing process, etc. And then after this training, we allow them to actually uh, collect data, which is actually, you know, uh, choose venues for uh, shooting their video clips, decide on what story they want to tell, decide on how they want to edit their story and how they want to portray their illness. Um, and then after this, um, and we'll see one of the final outputs of these videos in a subsequent clip, we actually just screen these uh, final outputs as they are to the community in the presence of both the creators of this content who are people with lived experience, and other stakeholders, like you know, um, biomedical practitioners, traditional health practitioners, faith healers, policy makers, like uh, government officials, etc. And when we screen this in the communities, we just allow for dialogue, we allow for questions, we allow for arguments, and we allow for debate, just as a way of trying to, you know, um, uh, listen to or get different perspectives of understanding of mental illness. So um, that's the context of the video um, that we've just seen. Right now, what are some of the impact of Difu Simmons initiatives and how do you evaluate Difu Simmons interventions? Um, so, um, I mean, Difu Simo um, is making great strides um, in raising awareness about mental illness, both in Kilifi, in the entire country, and even I can say regionally and internationally. Um, some of the achievements that we're most proud of are some of the outputs we are, we are having, like our documentaries and our clips, and also being able to do things like conducting awareness walks. Um, for example, during this COVID period alone, um, we've been able to conduct awareness walks in nine different locations within Kilifi County. Um, 
and we've been able to reach a very wide audience considering the very many restrictions. And we also continue to receive, you know, coverage from local uh, press, um, the national press and even international press. Um, and uh, it has generated a lot of, our work has generated a lot of interest on discussions around the role of culture in understanding uh, mental illness. And also, you know, the role of uh, art in addressing the challenges that we face in mental illness. And, uh, you know, we've also had opportunities to share our work in international platforms. For example, being here at the Hammer Festival today, uh, for which I'm very pleased to be taking part in. Um, and in terms of um, evaluation, um, the scientific approaches that we use uh, include, for example, um, structural, uh, structured questionnaires trying to compare, you know, changes in levels of knowledge, behavior, and attitude just as a result of the campaign itself. And we also use, uh, we use uh, qualitative methods quite extensively to just try and explore the perspectives of people with mental illnesses and also to explore practices like ethnodiagnosis, which is using um, traditional or indigenous knowledge to diagnose disorders. We also try to look at things like bioprospecting, which is uh, you know use of herbs to manage these disorders. So um, we use these scientific methods to try and understand the impact that Diffusimo is um, making and also to try and answer new questions that keep on coming up as a result of our experiences um, in the field. And maybe just one last thing that we do is, um, you know, we also do actual monitoring of medical records to see um, whether we are seeing an improvement or an increase in the proportions of people with mental illness seeking care or, you know, for, for their disorders, both in the hospitals and because we're also in touch with traditional healers and faith healers, we try to monitor their records to see if people are coming to them for help, uh, citing the campaign as one of their uh, motivation, motivating factors to seek help. So yes, quite interesting. Now, in my understanding, Difu Simon, that does not only does it create awareness of mental health, but also creates an um, an approach that will actually that helps people talk about it and also uh, get encouraged to get to learn more about mental health. Now, which actually brings me to the next clip, which is The Apprentice, an extra from Simon Grassi's film, Q Wee. I hope I actually pronounced that right. Um, the magic come, the magic comeback portraying a Mijikenda woman learning to become a traditional healer. Among the Mijikenda, there are diverse types of healer. The diviner is the one who can diagnose and identify the root cause of illness. An apprentice is undergoing a learning process under the counsel of a senior diviner. The novice lives in close proximity to her tutor in an isolated hut and undergoes a trial period. In this trial, the woman is instructed to seek guidance from the spirits in order to collect plants from the forest. After falling into a trance, the apprentice disappears as though summoned into the bush. This is an intimate journey into the remoteness of human spirituality that will take place in the seclusion of the forest environment.
plants collected in the forest are stored in the hut. And in the future, her mentor will analyze them to get to the information that she needs to be sure that this part of the course has been successfully completed. This personal voyage still has many rites of passage until its completion. At that stage, the apprentice will be presented with a basket of medicines and tools to practice her craft. These gifts, it is hoped, will one day be passed on to a new generation of diviners. Witchcraft, herbal medicine, divination, and the cult of the dead are all aspects of the Giriyaman ancestral culture. For the Giriyama, magic is a basic element of life. Matter and spirit coexist on the same plane, and often dreams are a channel of communication between deceased souls and their loved ones. Mary, can you tell us more about the can you tell us more about the short film that we just watched and discuss with us the alternative medical practitioners and say social support they provide for people with uh, mental health? Um, so the clip um, we've just watched again is, one, is uh, from one of the works that we do in the field, which is just trying to understand um, the traditional um, ways of diagnosing and managing different disorders, including mental illnesses in our case. Now, um, the clip is called Kiwiewe, which is a Kigiriyama phrase that means coming back to our roots. And I just want to point out some of the things that you've seen in the clip itself. You've seen, um, you know, there's intergenerational interaction. So the older people and the younger people, uh, the older people trying to pass on this skill to the younger people. We've seen things like a secret language between the apprentice and their teacher. We've seen even different genders. We have males and females trying to train this one apprentice. And, uh, you know, this just suggests that there is actually structure in the way that traditional medicine is trained in this culture, in this context. Now, um, what we've seen in the clip is actually just a traditional healer learning to perform what we call bioprospecting in plants, which is where they try to identify uh, plants with medicinal value. Now, to be able to use these plants to diagnose, I mean, to manage a person with whichever illness the person has, they must be able to know how to diagnose the illness itself so that they can be able to give the correct herb or the correct medicine, which is what we call ethnodiagnosis, where you use indigenous knowledge um, to diagnose disorders. And so, you know, just to point out or to emphasize that even in traditional practices of healing, there is structure, um, there's a training duration, there's evaluation of success or failure, because as you saw in the clip, if the apprentice came back with the wrong herbs, then they would have failed the, the assessment and their training would perhaps have ended there. And I know these are usually some of the criticisms or some of the points that are used to uh, criticize traditional medicine uh, in terms of lack of structure, lack of an evidence base, but just to point out that even in this, you know, practices, there's a lot of work and effort that goes into training our people to be able to practice.
Now, um, you asked about, you know, alternative medical practitioners and the psychosocial support that they provide for people with mental health. Um, so when we talk about alternative practitioners, just to be clear, here we are talking about like uh, faith healers, these could be pastors, they could be moms, we are talking about uh, priests as well, you know, we're also talking about traditional health practitioners, um, who, by the way, in this setting fall into very many categories. And I like to say they fall into structures that are very similar to what we see in biomedical practices, because even in traditional medicine, we have diagnosticians. These are people who whose primary job is to diagnose. We have people who practice both diagnostics and uh, exorcism. We have people who practice herbal medicine, which is now, um, like I said, bioprospecting, giving prescription. So even within the, the traditional medicine, there are a lot of structures and different specialties or specializations, if you like. Now, um, one of the key roles that they play, like you have said, is psychosocial support. And um, psychosocial support comes in the form of counseling for people with mental illnesses. And um, the support, you know, may not be as structured as what we are used to in uh, biomedical practice. For example, in biomedicine, we talk about things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is 12 structured session where you see a counselor and you come again and again. But what the advantage of these traditional forms of counseling is that, um, you know, uh, it plays the same role because what it does is it addresses the psychological difficulties that a patient with mental illness is facing. And what they do is that they provide very patient-centered solutions and the solutions that they provide are very culturally appropriate. And maybe I'll just give an example um, of a study that was done about uh, eight years ago that was trying to look at uh, traditional practices of healing in epilepsy. And uh, some of the reasons that people give for why they prefer traditional healers for psychosocial support to biomedical practitioners is that one, um, among other things was that they gave them a lot of time and they gave them very logical explanations for the causes of their disease. And this is important for the reason that, remember when we talk about mental illness, even in the context of biomedicine, we are talking about two things. We are talking about the mind and behavior. Now these two concepts are very complex and they are very broad, but most importantly, they are very contextually different. And so to find someone who addresses these issues in a contextually relevant way is very important. And that's the role that traditional healers or alternative practitioners play um, in this community in terms of addressing mental illness. As a person who've, who creates content to create uh, awareness of mental health, in your experience, what are the advantages or disadvantages of looking at mental illness through a primarily traditional lens? Um, you know, um, um, one of the things, uh, I mean, Nelson Mandela once said that, you know, if you talk to a man in a language they understand, it goes into their head. But if you talk to a man in their language, it goes into their heart. And what the traditional lens provides is an opportunity to speak to people about mental health using their traditional beliefs and their culture and what this does is that it actually opens up opportunities to break the barriers of stigma because some of the causes of stigma is just the myths around the causes of mental illness. And unfortunately, unlike um, physical illnesses, with mental illnesses, we do not have you know, laboratory measures. You can't go into the lab and get a positive depression test. There is no biochemical marker of saying um, your depression positive or your depression negative. And even when you have depression, for example, it's on a spectrum. We have people with mild forms, moderate forms, severe forms. This is not, for instance, the case with HIV or malaria. It's either you have it or you don't, but with mental illness, it's not black and white, and that's why you know it's a whole spectrum. So what traditional, uh, the traditional lens does is to just help us understand these things in our cultural context and how they present. For example, again, I'll refer to a piece of work that we tried to do, um, a piece of research that we tried to do, a qualitative piece of work that we tried to do to understand some of the common uh, signs and symptoms of common mental disorders in this setting. Now, one of the disorders we were looking at uh, was dementia. And nobody in this setting had ever heard of dementia, despite the fact that we tried to use vignettes to explain the disorder, the signs and symptoms, they did not regard dementia as a mental illness. And even depression in this setting in some of the work that we did, 
they only regarded it as sadness, but not something that meets diagnostic threshold for a mental illness. So you see, unless we address this from that context or from that point of view, we are unlikely to make any strides you know, in breaking the stigma. And the unfortunate consequence is that people with severe forms of this disorder who can actually be helped end up not receiving any assistance at all. Um, and then, you know, of course, the disadvantage of this is that, I mean, just like as I've said, um, Kilifi is just one context. And even in Kilifi itself, there's so many different cultures. And uh, you can imagine, you know, how long it would take for us if we are taking a strictly cultural perspective to address this and looking at everyone's culture, context, and beliefs. Although we say, you know, we have a lot of things in common, but then again, we have a lot of differences. This will take some time and this will take a lot of investment and resource. And the result of this is what happens to the people with severe disorder in the meantime, like Changawa? Do we leave them chained as we address this issue at this phase? So those are just some of the disadvantages of strictly taking a traditional lens um, in addressing um, mental illnesses. Right, now we actually see in a lot of countries, not just uh, Kenya and not just in Kilifi County, a lot of countries we see that traditional uh, healers, just like mental illness, people living with mental illness face stigma. Now, what are some uh, what are some of particular challenges of destigmatizing both mental health and traditional healing? I think I'll begin by talking about traditional healing and perhaps you know just talking, I mean, throwing it back as a question, you know, what, like, what causes stigma in traditional healing? Where did this come from in the first place, considering this is part of our culture and, you know, all the way from our origins? And I think one of the biggest unspoken issues is the colonial legacies that led to the stigma that is now attached to um, traditional medicine. Um, and, you know, it is an issue that remains largely unaddressed, even as we try to come up with interventions to, you know, first of all, destigmatize traditional medicine, because, I mean, in earnest, or, I mean, uh, uh, speaking the, the plain truth is that even the medications that we use today have a basis in plants, in herbs, and in things that exist in nature, which if we keenly look at history, particularly for other disorders, we see that um, there are a lot of similarities or a lot of parallels between traditional medicine and biomedicine in the understanding of disorders and in their management. And so I think, you know, just addressing what the colonial influence was in uh, creating stigma in traditional medicine will in itself open doors to dialogue about how then we can leverage on the you know, indigenous knowledge that still exists to try and break this barrier of stigma. And um, you know, talking about uh, the challenges that we face in destigmatizing mental illness. Now, hey, you know, uh, one thing that I've learned from just learning this project is um, if you want to understand something, try and change it, you know, um, and uh, as I've been doing this project, I've realized that it is not just as straightforward as saying people don't know this, we want them to know this, or people don't understand this, we want them to understand it in this way. Um, I think with mental health, you know, um, one of the challenges that we have faced as enthusiasts or as people who are really keen about, you know, breaking the stigma and changing the cycle is that we haven't given enough of a listening ear to the community, to context, to culture, to people with lived experience. And I think that those are some of the challenges that I have seen um, in my experience with Bikusimo. Uh, just like you mentioned, traditional medicine, just like biomedicine have the same structure. And if we make sure that we put them together, we can actually see that both of them actually help in different ways, but for the better of the people. Um, to just go, go, go ahead, we have the next clip, uh, Samuel Mturi, a participant of Difu Simo's initiative speaks of his experience with mental illness and supports from family, biomedicine and religion. Let's take a look. Okay, my name is Samuel Mturi. I'm 21 years old and I'll be talking about my experience with mental illness. Well, 
first of all, I'm bipolar, and that's a condition in which people's mood swings fluctuate. Like one moment you could be happy and hyper, the next moment you could be depressed and sad. So I've been having this condition for around eight months. So at around March this year, 2019, yeah, at that time I'd been having strange de- dreams and I'd be sharing with my girlfriend and telling her about the dreams, but we could just laugh them off. Then one night I had a dream that I was in a funeral. It was somebody's funeral, somebody had died. And the next morning I shared with my girlfriend and we just left it off as usual. Then after one week, I'm walking with my girlfriend. She was going home. She receives a call. And after the call, she was silent and she was crying. And um, I was asking her what was the problem and she wasn't telling me anything. Then finally, she told me that her dad had been involved in an accident. So I offered to take her home, but she refused. And I was like, oh, it's okay, let her go home. So the next day she didn't come to class because we're in the same school and in the same class. That, then the other day she didn't come to class again. So when she finally came to class, she was rude to me and I didn't know what was wrong. So I, I just thought of that. She, it was a way of coping with the accident. Then one night when I was asleep, I remembered that I dreamt of somebody dying. And then that's when it hit me that, you know, her father could be dead or she, he could be dying soon. So I was blaming myself for the accident and everything. And I also thought that maybe she remembered of the dream and that's why she was blaming me for everything. So after another week, the father passed on and it was rough for her. And it was also rough for me because I had gotten used to that girl and seeing her sad and angry was making me sad, but she wasn't treating me like she she used to treat me. I was used to love and affection from her, but right now she was cold towards me. And I tried to commit suicide because I thought of the cause of the death and everything. But I did, luckily I didn't die, as you can see, I'm here. I took rat poison, but the rat poison had expired, so I, couldn't, I, was, I wasn't dead. So after that, I got depressed. I used to cry all the time, just cry. Out of nowhere, I could just start crying. So the doctor saw that, the school doctor saw that I wasn't fit to do my exams and I was sent home. And we broke up with my girlfriend. And I'd like to thank that my parents were supportive of me and my friends, like they didn't shun me off. They showed me love and they took me to the hospital. And that's when I came to learn that I was bipolar. And right now I'm taking my medicine and I'm okay. There's one time I, I laid off the medicine and the depressive episodes came in, but right now I'm taking my medicine and I'm okay. So I'd like to tell the people who are like me, just continue taking your medication and know that you're normal. Anyone can be affected with mental illness and also prayer helps because to me, prayer and religion help me a lot. Yeah, so that's my story. Thank you. Mary, tell us more about uh, this short video that we just watched and also discuss with us the biomedical interventions. Uh, the short video of Samuel is actually one of the outputs of the participatory video exercises that I talked about earlier. And you know what we do with these kind of videos is we show them in the community and in the presence of Samuel and he gets to talk about his illness. Now, let me just try and draw some parallels between, you know, Samuel's story and Changawa's story. As you can see, in both cases, um, you know, um, they sought help from different um, practitioners. Uh, you know, Samuel says he, he got help from hospital and he also got help from faith healers, like, you know, his religious leaders who helped him cope. Uh, but as you can see, um, uh, and I hope everyone gets a chance to watch Changawa's story, um, Samuel has a lot of insight about what he's suffering from. Uh, he has a lot of insight about his signs and symptoms, and he has a lot of insight even about his, you know, the, the course of his illness, how it developed, what triggered it, you know, even attempting suicide, recovering and everything. And 
you know, these are some of the, what I would call positive effects of biomedical interventions. They help someone understand, you know, uh, what they're going through. He's talked about medication, which is one of, um, you know, the cornerstones or the focus of uh, biomedical interventions. And he's also talked about side effects of medication. He talked about temporarily stopping treatment and then relapsing with depression, which um, is, you know, in itself one of the challenges or one of the uh, big criticisms of biomedical interventions. What happens, for example, when you can no longer access care, you cannot afford it, and you, re uh, you know, you, you discontinue and the, uh, relap the consequences such as relapse or worsening of your condition. So, um, uh, some, but as you can see, Samuel has been adhering to his treatment. He's now able to tell his story. Um, thankfully, Samuel went back to university and he was able to continue the schooling, just showing uh, how important it is for someone to access care because they can be very productive and meaningful members of society if they get help very early, as is the case of Samuel. Right, now, are there any advantages or disadvantages of looking at uh, mental illness through a primarily biomedical lens? I think I've already touched on, you know, some of the advantages because, um, and I'll speak particularly about severe mental illness, for example, schizophrenia or severe depression. Um, you know, there is already an evidence base of treatments that work. And so one of the advantages of, you know, the biomedical approach is that people can actually, uh, resume with their lives or continue being productive in the community if they access treatment first and foremost in a timely manner and second of all you know continuously you know without breaking the cycles of treatment so there is evidence that biomedicine works and it helps people to get better um you know uh, and of course we do know that, of course, there are measurable chemical changes in the brain that tell us, you know, this person is having depression or not. Uh, for example, you know, the imbalances in things like dopamine and serotonin, which are neurotransmitters in the brain. So biomedicine helps us understand better, you know, what are the chemical processes that are happening in our brain, or at least they provide some explanation. And uh, we cannot overlook this advantage. You cannot say that it is not helping at all because it in fact is helping. But of course, some of the disadvantages of just uh, strictly using the biomedical approaches, like I said, we miss out on context and we miss out on, um, you know, um, alternative forms of psychosocial support, which begs the question, even if the person recovers, what is their quality of life like, you know? are they able to be reintegrated back to the community because of the stigma and the discrimination? And I guess um, we'll be talking about this later, but this is why we say that there's no panacea, there's no one way of doing this and we must use many approaches in a combined form if we are to make any progress in addressing stigma. Right now, actually, you've actually touched on the disadvantages and advantages, of course, you touched on them earlier, but could you tell us some of the advantages that you've, you have observed in using a holistic approach to supporting people living with mental illness? Um, I think this boils down to, you know, what our end goal usually is when we are thinking about a person with mental illness over and above everything else. We are interested in having this person have the best quality of life that they can. Now, remember, um, you know, quality of life in itself is a construct that is defined by the society that you live in, the culture that you live in. And I think everybody wants to feel like they're a useful member of the community. So, you know, thinking about what biomedicine can do, you know, it can um, minimize the signs and symptoms of these disorders and, you know, make you, a, make you functional so that you're able to function. For example, in the case of schizophrenia, it reduces symptoms of aggressiveness, bizarre behavior, etc. But also thinking about the alternative forms, you know, the alternative methods, the psychosocial support, you know, can open up venues for you to be able to reintegrate back to your community. The faith healing, it works on your psyche, in the mind, on your mind, like we said, which is a very important part of, you know, giving you that desire to continue living your life. You might, you might have no symptoms, but if within yourself you have no willpower to do anything, then what becomes of your quality of life? So using quality of life as our main focus, we think that if all these practitioners come together and work in synergy, then the outcome will be not only will the patient have no symptoms, but they'll also have a very good um, quality of life. Right, now um, we're actually gonna go to the Q&A. We just got a question from the audience. Um, 
This one is, how have you managed to introduce traditional healing methods? Has there been pushback in policy and institutional settings? Um, so, um, you know, I, I would just start by saying, so this is one of the things that Difusimo has been very keen about, not, you know, imposing or introducing anything, but perhaps the question would be, how have we managed to just open those avenues for dialogue? And one of the ways in which we've done this is uh, to create setups or meetings where these different practitioners actually come together and debate issues that they don't agree on. I must be honest and say some of the very first meetings were very chaotic because there was no consensus about um, you know, how to, how to, which approach to take. And the reason we realized at the very beginning was that we were taking the wrong approach. At the beginning, our focus was on the practice of these two groups of people. And then we changed focus and we now say, how about focusing on the patient? Now, when we changed our focus from the practice of the different practitioners to the patient's well-being, we found that they actually had one goal or one interest in common, which was to see the patient get better. And that is the point at which we you know as moderators, we said, now how can the different practitioners work together to get the patient better? And it has been very successful. And let me give you a very practical output that we've had from this um, campaign itself is that for patients who come to see biomedical practitioners, one of the things the care provider does, the biomedical practitioner is to encourage them to actually come with their traditional healer or their faith healer in the next visit. And what the biomedical practitioner does is to explain the treatment regimen to the traditional healer or to the faith healer and to tell them to continue providing psychosocial support or the talk therapies, talk to them, but also encourage them to take treatment. That's something that's actually happening right now in practice. So that has been a very overwhelmingly positive outcome of the campaign. Well, thank you very much, Mary. That's actually most of the time that we had on this panel. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, for sparing time to speak to us again. And I hope it gets a bit chilly or cold wherever you are. <laughs> thank you again. Thank you. Well, that was Mary Bita, a mental health researcher and Difu Simos principal investigator. Um, that is all the time we have for today. She actually touched on various forms of mental health intervention that people can use to heal mental illnesses. Thank you very much for staying with us and stay tuned because more is coming. Mm -hmm.